praise God. Amen. What a great joy, what a great joy it is to be here today. My wife and I are so, so, so excited to, to come and join the family of worship. And um, I believe we're going to have a glorious time. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for, for inviting us. It's been such a joy and way of the back, Pastor Yala. Thank you so much. We're so excited to be here. The, the time that we connected and we got to meet and do lunch, it was, it was such a joy to get to know your hearts. And I want you to know that you are so blessed to have pastors that love you, that, that pray for you, that are willing to go the extra mile just for you. And uh, we were so excited about the opportunity of connecting with them and getting to know them and hearing all the amazing stories of faith. They are such a faith couple. It's just, it's just so, so, so amazing. But uh, I bring greetings from our spiritual father, Apostle Nicky van der Stazen, and he sent us with his blessing, and he prayed and blessed us and sent a, a message on, on voice note just to say, uh, let there be a supernatural flow here, let there be the power of God, let supernatural things happen. So we're going to have a wonderful time today. Amen. Are you ready for a supernatural encounter? Before, before I preach, I, I'd love for my wife to come and pray for us and just open for us. Princess Kat, I'm married to one very, very beautiful, very gorgeous wife. In fact, I think the most beautiful woman in the whole world. Which I have to say. Praise the Lord. Is this the price of being a pastor's wife? <laughs> Praise God. It's so lovely to be here. What a wonderful family you are. I just, the love of God is just filled in this place. But what I know is that get ready for a takeoff. Are you ready tonight? Have you got your seatbelt secured on? Because there'll be so much turbulence. So you need to get yourselves ready. Amen. I love the theme breaking the cycle. Okay, I don't, okay. Let me pray. Let me not share anything. I'm very dead because um, let, me, let me not get into anything. Let me not open up the scriptures. But in Exodus, when the children of Israel were crying out to be let go, right after the, at, after the ninth plague, um, Pharaoh says to them, you may go. You may go, but leave your, your, um, the cattle and leave all your livestock, but you may go. And Moses said to them, we won't go. We will not even leave a shoe latchet, nothing, because we cannot go out to the mountain and worship God without it. There's something powerful about understanding the depth of worship and how worship comes in giving God all that you have. Where he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, the original talks about all your resources. And so Moses and the children of Israel had a revelation that we cannot go to worship God without our resources. And so he says we'd rather stay put. And so when the tenth plague happened, when Pharaoh called out for the children of Israel to go, he says, go, tell them, take everything of yours, take everything and go. And beforehand, even Moses said they wanted the gold and the silver. And so because you know when the, 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 the pain that the enemy felt because of the children of God and the, the pain that your competitors will face, the pain that, you know, the wealth that is stored for you which is in the hands of the wicked, when it's time to release and let go, they will just say, take it all. Take the tender, take the promotion, take the, take it all, take it all, take it all, take it all. amen. So as children of the covenant children who begin to realize and understand that we've been called to absolute worship where when we say Lord we are here to worship you with everything that is it and building the kingdom of God amen so let's just pray father we thank you tonight thank you for your word thank you father this conference has been awesome it's been amazing from its opening father I thank you that every word that has been spoken from this platform and every word that will be prophesied from this platform I thank you father that it is ground breaking father it breaks every yoke of bondage in the name of jesus 
Father, I thank you the shackles will be broken. I thank you that the blindness that have been set before their eyes will be opened and released and let go in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for a heart of worship, Father, that is filled in ministry and grace, church of God. I thank you, Father, that great grace is upon this household, upon this family, and I thank you that their lives and our lives, Father, will never be the same as we come to your word. And I thank you for Pastor Titch, Lord, as he stands to minister. Open up his heart, open his eyes, Father. May you give him words from the throne room of heaven, Lord, specific delivery for each and every one of us that are here tonight. In the name of Jesus, anoint his lips of clay, and may he submit to you, Lord, and that your word may increase, that your people may see the truth of the word of God. I give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And all the people of God said, Amen. Praise God, you are blessed. Praise God, Amen. Now I'm anointed. <laughs> praise God, Amen. Are you ready for the word? Amen. I'll take a few minutes just to lay some foundations and we'll step into, into some glorious uh, things. I want to speak today on the subject, taking the wealth of the wicked. Um, some, some seven or so years ago, you'll get the full story in my, in my book, um, uh, The Judea Abraham Equal Factor. Uh, and really, and really, I believe this is a very good book. I've read it many times. I wrote it, but I've read it many times. This morning, I, was, I read through chapter one to chapter three, I think. Just, just meditating on the word of God, but I, I'm not, I'm not a marketer. I'm a man of God, so I may not be good at marketing, but I know that the principles that are in this book will change your life. Over the last uh, couple of years, the Lord began to speak to me about millionaire status, and the Lord began to speak to through me prophetically to speak to the body of Christ that it is time for the church to step into the millionfold anointing and thereafter into billionaire status. And I know many people, when I started talking about this, many people were just thinking, okay, no pastors are supposed to talk because sometimes in the church, that's what people think. They think we, we just are supposed to inspire and motivate people. But in the last three years, there are seven people that, that we can go to now that have become millionaires because of the teaching and the coaching that we've been giving them. And the principles are in the book. The principles that I've been teaching them are in the book. One particular uh, gentleman who saw me two years ago teaching at Pastor Nikki uh, Van der Stasen's church, his dad had asked me to come and minister at a business meeting in the morning session during Movement of the Supernatural. And as I taught, he sat there and heard me teaching. His company at that moment was in the red, meaning they were in debt heavily in debt and um, uh, things were not going too well. He had about 30 employees that were working for him. So he had to stagger the salaries and pay half the staff one month and the following month he pays the other half because things were not going well. So when he heard me at the at movement of the supernatural teaching on supernatural wealth, he then said, can you come and teach what we're teaching here in my business? And I asked him and I said, do you want me to give you the corporate version? Because all my teachings, when it comes to coaching, I have the church version and I have the corporate version. The corporate version, I remove the verses, but sometimes I do coaching in NetBank and a couple of other places. So I can't always quote verses. So every so often I remove the verses, just give the principles without saying John says. So he says, no, I want you to come and teach it exactly the same way you taught it at Pastor Nikki. So for the last two years, I've been going there once, one Friday every month to coach all his staff members. A couple of months after we started coaching, he said to me, uh, before you teach, I want the staff to tell you something. And they all shouted out, we all got paid on the 25th. That meant the company had begun to move out of debt into profit. We were there the other day, they were telling us we're now completely out of debt and their goal for the next five years is to make an annual turnover of one billion rand. So we're now coaching the company to make one billion rand on an annual basis. So that's what we do. I'm a financial coach, business coach, success coach, and marriage coach. That's what my wife and I do. In fact, on the next slide, you'll see a couple of, uh, a few of the businesses that my wife and I are running. We run 
uh, Stories of Hope, that's movies, Dillium School of Business Coaching, School of Transformational Leadership, Success Paradigms 101, uh, Paradigm Network, Millionaire Kids Club, who just launched a new company which is coaching kids to become millionaires by the time they get to matric. So the first, the first victims of this are our kids. We're working on coaching them and we've started businesses for them that will make them millionaires by the time they get to metric. So we have we have a whole book, a new book that's coming out actually in the next maybe week or so, which is called uh, Discovering the Millionaire Within, which is a tool to help parents coach their children not to think poverty but to think wealth because there's a millionaire or a billionaire in every human being. It's just how we are taught when we're growing up that determines whether we end up as a millionaire or we end up in debt. So some of the principles that we'll teach today will help you to begin to realize, hey, there is a wealth factor on the inside of you. You cannot be the child of a wealthy God and be poor unless you're neglecting certain principles. So God has given us biblical principles that are designed to move each one of us to our millionaire status. Nudge your neighbor and say, I'm a millionaire. Come and nudge your other neighbor and say, you better treat me good. I'm really wealthy. Now, Billionaires Connect, that's, that coach is the one right at the bottom. That's coaching for adults, financial coaching to help them become millionaires. So we have, and I'm also, we also run our own publishing house. That's the one that's publishing our books, Faithland Publishers. And out of that came Faithland Books, Faithland Kids coaching children to write books and marrying and loving it. So there's a whole lot of businesses that my wife and I are overseeing. And all of these were started in the last uh, six years. When we discovered this anointing upon our lives, it gave birth to 16 businesses. So you can tell what God can do in your life when you discover the anointing that God has put on the inside of you. I was happy being a pastor. I enjoy pastoring. I love preaching the word. But one day God said, this anointing needs to work in your life so that your life can be a living example of what I want to do with the people in your church. 60% of the members in our church are business owners. 60% of the 400 and something members that we have are business owners. But when we started, we only had about 16% of the big business owners. Now what has happened over the last few years, as they began to understand the principles that are in the book, they began to move out of the place of bondage, oppression, debt, lack, into the place of abundance, prosperity, fruitfulness, increase, which is God's divine design for each child of God. Somebody say, I'm a millionaire. Let's say it again. Say, I'm a millionaire. Say it one last time with a bit of attitude. Say, I'm a millionaire. Praise God. The Bible says, you shall have what you say. One of my favorite chapters in the book, actually, is a chapter called, What Language Do You Speak? There's a chapter in here called, What Language Do You Speak? And it's sort of a question asking whether you speak English, Afrikaans, Veda, Zulu, or Corsa. It is asking whether you speak a language called poverty. You cannot become wealthy if your language is poverty. You cannot become rich if your language is lack. You cannot have a great marriage if your language is divorce. You cannot live a healthy life if your language is sickness. So it is important that you begin to understand that whatever language you speak will determine the lifestyle that you will live. Whatever you put before you will determine what you become. If you ever notice when you go to Virgin Active, how many of you go to the gym? When you go to Virgin Active or whatever, I don't know what gyms you have here, but uh, you don't go to the gym? Okay. If you ever notice when you go to the gym, what do you see all over the wall? The mirrors, but you see pictures of all these hunks. You see the six pack and the and, and you look so because they understand the picture of mental conditioning, they are creating a picture in your mind of what you're desiring to be. But when you go to a hospital, what do you see? You see kidneys and livers cut in half and you, you see all these medical pictures because that's a hospital, that's what they do. But I actually think they should turn it around. They should put good pictures in hospital. They shouldn't put all those ugly things that scare you. They should put pictures of what you should become, not what you are. Because you always become what you look at. So I want to share with you today some principles that will help you to change your language, change your focus, and ultimately you'll change your lifestyle. 
Praise God. Are you ready for that? Are you ready for that? Great. Let's read some scriptures. We're going to start in the book of Joshua, chapter 6 and verse 1 and 2. And you'll see it up on the screen. If you have a Bible, that's still great. So let's go over to our first slide. It says that now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into your hand Jericho and the king and the mighty men of Valah. I want you to notice. Let's read it again. Now Jericho was straightly shut up. Why? Because of the children of Israel. Because of the children of Israel, Satan locks up economies, Satan locks up money, Satan locks up business, not because of any other reason except he is locking it up because of you. Satan is afraid of you getting money. Satan is afraid of you walking in your millionaire status. Satan is afraid of you becoming wealthy. Why? Because if you become wealthy, guess what? This church will be able to buy this whole block from street to street. We'll be able to put up a beautiful ministry center, youth center, youth facilities that will allow the kids to come off the streets, come off drugs, and come and worship and play and enjoy themselves in the house of God. So Satan doesn't want the church to be wealthy. Satan doesn't want you to be a multi-millionaire because you're going to be paying for buses to pick up kids from the streets to bring them to you on Friday or Saturday. You will begin to change the city if you walked in your millionaire status. So the, it says Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. One translation says, another translation says, Jericho being shut up was shut up. Now that means there was intensive security. There's security measures to control access. No one went out and no one came in. Why? Because they were afraid of the children of Israel. Satan is controlling economies in different countries, different cities, different places, primarily because he needs to channel money into the hands of sinners and not into the hands of covenant people. You have to understand that. You have to understand that. So, but notice the next part of the verse. It says, uh, he, God said to Joshua, see, I have given you. Now, I study, I study Hebrew. I study Hebrew. And when you read the Bible in the Hebrew language, a lot of what we read in English loses the original meaning. And we kind of lose certain truths because in translating, kind of like playing broken telephone. How many of you ever played broken telephone? You try and pass a message and you're whispering, by the time it gets to the third, fourth, fifth person, the message has kind of changed. So in the same way, as they translated the Bible, certain truths were lost. That's why I call this book the Judeo-Abrahamic. I go back and I begin to speak to people in English but from a Hebrew mindset. Because you've got to understand what the original writer intended for you to understand, not what the translator was saying. So the next part of the verse, God says, see, I have given you. Now the word see in the Hebrew has a very strong inference that says, take note of something that you may not be able to take note of unless I emphasize it. So when he puts a word like see, he didn't put it there accidentally. It's not like, oh, look, there's a, there's a speaker. When he says, see the speaker, it means it's possible that I could have missed seeing the speaker. So it is an emphasis of the existence of something that you need to take note of. So what did he want you to take note of? He wanted you to take note of this very fact. See, I have given into your hand Jericho and the king and the mighty men meaning it is possible that you could have missed the fact that Jericho is already yours the city is already yours the king is already yours the mighty men are already yours it is easy to miss it because it was straightly shut up have you ever tried to go into a certain line of business but it was straightly shut up and you thought my goodness I can never go into there I never thought I'd be running a publishing house. I never thought I'd be running, doing some of the things. One of the latest things that we've just started is a bank. We started a bank called Paradigm Bank and it's going to start running. We're going to be financing kingdom businesses to become multi-million, million rand businesses for the primary purpose of tithing and sowing into the kingdom of God. 
But I could have looked at it and said, we can't go in there. But God had already said, see. Meaning there's something that you can miss because of your crisis. I always tell people this statement, don't try and write it down because your hand will get stuck. The crisis of crisis is when you're in crisis, all you see is crisis. And all you can produce is crisis because that's all you can see. You can only produce what you can see. If you cannot see the opportunity, if you cannot see that God has given you Jericho, if you cannot see that God has called you to be a millionaire, if you cannot see that God has called you to run a business, you will never do it. And most people have minds that have been blocked by Satan and they cannot see themselves dead free. According to statistics, 90 to 95% of South Africa is living in consumptive debt. Consumptive debt means Debt, you are in debt for something that you have clothes, food, nails, hair. <laughs> now that's really bad. 90 to 95 percent. That means most of the people looking at me right now are in debt. And we're going to talk about that just now. But if you cannot see yourself living debt free, my wife and I are debt free. We live, we chose to be debt free. Why? Because debt will cripple you. It will bind you. It will hold you back. It's a silent prison that will limit your ability to walk in the fullness of what God has prepared for you. So God says, see, because you can only possess what you can see. You cannot possess, you cannot take a hold of what you cannot see. If you cannot see yourself as a millionaire, you can never be one. If you cannot see yourself happily married, you can never be happily married. If you cannot see yourself healthy and living long, you won't live long. You've got to see it before you can possess it. The next passage of scripture says, But you shall remember the Lord your God, that it is he that giveth you the power to do what? To get well. Why? To establish his covenant, which he says, I have sworn unto your, to your fathers as it is this day. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he that has given you the power, the ability, the wherewithal to get wealth. There is power to get wealth. God wouldn't give us power to get wealth if he didn't want us wealthy. In fact, let's establish this right now. I will say a couple of things that may come up a bit strong and they may be controversial, but it's okay. Uh, I'll give you scripture for everything that I say so that you can go back and check if what Pastor Teach said is actually in the Bible. Now, in the book, I give you hundreds of scriptures that prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that God wants every one of his children wealthy. Now people have challenged me and said, are you saying God wants everybody wealthy? I said, yes, exactly. He wants everybody wealthy. Then, then religious people will say, but you know, the Bible says uh, that Jesus was speaking and he says, uh, the poor you will have with you always. And it's true. He did say that. But the problem is we read our Bible in English. <laughs> We shouldn't have read it in English. We should have read the original word that he said. Jesus, when he made that statement, if you go back to the original rendition of that scripture, he literally says, those that are of a reprobate mind, you will have with you always. So poverty or being poor is a state of having a reprobate mind. A reprobate mind is a mind that is unproductive. So your poverty will always be to the measure of the unproductiveness of your mind. So that means if you are going to become wealthy, you're going to have to get a hold of your mind, fix up your mind, change the way you think, transform your way of thinking, begin to think in a different way, begin to see in a different way, begin to talk in a different way, because the Bible says a good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth that which is good, and an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth that which is evil. A tree shall be known by its fruit, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So the reality that you live is to the quality of the thinking that you will possess. So the poor we will have with us always, yes, because there are people that have reprobate minds that refuse to think productively. But it ought not to be in the house of God. 
children of God ought to think like Christ. The Bible says we have the mind of Christ. We ought to think like Christ. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if you think poverty, you will live poverty. If you think prosperity, you will begin to produce prosperity. I am a living example. I came into South Africa 11, 12 years ago as a missionary. And uh, when, I, when we arrived in South Africa, because I was, I, I'm originally from Zimbabwe, we had to get work permits. Now to get work permits, uh, it was actually a missionary permit, I had to go to SAPRA, uh, the Qualifications Evaluation Board, and submit my qualifications, and uh, they rated them, and when they completed the rating, they said I was the equivalent of a grade 10. My, my qualifications were the equivalent of a grade 10. Was it 10? I think it was 10. Yeah, it was 10. But on Saturday, I'm actually graduating with my master's in Christian leadership. So here's the irony. Here's the irony. Satan thought he could confine me to a certain place because of the status that I was given. But I chose to defy it and renew, rewire, change my mind. So any mind can change. Okay, that's good. Some people are looking at me like, are you sure? I'm, I'm very sure. If my teachers, I always tell people, if my teachers in school, in high school, could see me now, they would fall flat on their faces. They wouldn't understand that that boy that was the worst in the class, worst in the school, is not. I coach millionaires. I coach political party leaders. I coach business leaders. I coach very influential people. I speak in very big conferences. They would not understand how that, that little boy has written nine books and I'm writing 16 more books that will be published very, very soon. They wouldn't know that how that little boy is now running 16 businesses. It's the power of God at work in me because I refuse to have a reprobate mind. You can change your life and your state by changing your thinking. Mm, so God, somebody say, God has given me the power to get well. It's getting exciting here. Yeah, let's, let's look at another scripture. Let's look at another scripture on the next slide. It says, And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off your shoulder and his yoke from off your neck. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Now, if you were to read the whole chapter in Isaiah 10, let me give you the context of what he is speaking about here. The nation was in debt. The nation was paying financial or gold tribute to an oppressor, a nation that had come to oppress them. Now, because they were in oppression, the king got a revelation that the only reason we are serving this king and paying gold every month, paying sheep and, and paying our resources to this king every month is because we've gone away from the Torah. The Torah being the books of the Jewish books, the, the Bible. So, here's what he did. The king got high amounts of money and bought quite a lot of oil and distributed the oil amongst the people. What was the oil for? Very good question. The oil was the equivalent of electricity because they used oil for light. So the king gave an allocation of oil to the whole nation. Why? Because he says, I want you to spend extra hours every night studying the Torah. So it was the studying of the word of God that empowered them to get out of debt. So when he said, it shall come to pass in that day that his burden, what burden was it? It was a financial burden. It was a financial yoke. How do we remove financial yokes from our lives? By studying. There's a good question. How much time have you spent studying your financial freedom? Do you have a book on your library on finances and financial prosperity and financial freedom? How much time are you investing on studying how to be financially prosperous? People want financial freedom. We cry about it and we, we, we 
going to talk about financial freedom. We want our company to give us 2.5% salary increase as if it is going to change your financial position. Here's a, here's a fact. If your boss was to give you your whole salary for the next 50 years of work in one month, would that make you wealthy? It won't. So you're not going to get wealthy by salary. You're not going to get financially free from the salary. It's going to have to be a strategy that comes from heaven. It's going to have to be the practice of this passage of scripture. His yoke shall be destroyed because of the oil, because of the anointing, the oil of you studying the word of God, studying the principles of prosperity, giving time to say, I can change my life, I can change my reality by seeing what I could have missed had I not looked at it with a spirit of revelation. Have a look at this nice little picture on the next slide. Does this look a bit like somebody you know? Does that look familiar? See that guy down there? Burdened by debt. You know why people can't come to church sometimes? Because we're busy trying to make money. Busy trying to survive. We can't serve God because Satan has put so much pressure. We have to work overtime, double time, so much that we get fatigued even when, when we try. That's exactly what Satan did with the children of Israel. When Moses came and he said, let my people go, speaking the word of the Lord. Let my people go that they may worship me in the mountain. Pharaoh then said, double the amount of work. Tell them I want them to keep delivering the same amount of bricks. But don't give them straw. What was that? It's called mental conditioning. What's the process of mental conditioning? The process of mental conditioning is put people in a cycle that becomes habitual. They do it without thinking. They do it without processing. They do it without creativity. So a lot of people are in the grind. Wake up in the morning, read my newspaper, listen to the news, go to work, one o'clock go for lunch, and then five o'clock go back home, turn on my television, watch seven delay, and then switch it off, and then go to bed. And when pastor says, have you been studying the word, you say, no pastor, I'm too tired. You should have switched off seven delay and you, you opened your Bible. Oh, did I say something wrong here? <laughs> So instead of focusing on the word, we're watching television. And what will television do? Every 10 minutes, every 15 minutes, they bring out the latest television. They bring out the latest car. They bring out the latest refrigerator. And guess what they tell you? You can get this one for $7.99.99 for just seven months. And you can get it on extra special. And da -da 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 -da. you can get this funeral policy. So what happened in your mind? Now you're no longer going to trust God for your next financial breakthrough. You're going to trust the bank, you're going to trust Joshua Doe, you're going to trust whatever furniture company, and you're not going to believe God. So because Joshua Doe is offering you a refrigerator for 14 months of debt, you're not going to think that God can bless me with 14,000 rand to buy the furniture. <laughs> Mental conditioning puts you in a prison and you'll sit comfortably in the prison without realizing that you're in a prison. Whoa. I better be nice. I want to be invited back here for some time in the next five years. So I really have to be nice. So you can you can get all that stuff up there by debt. Or you can get that stuff up there by practicing the principles that we're teaching today. Everything in our house is paid for. The couches, the tables, the refrigerator, the beds, everything, it's paid for. Nobody can I'm not afraid to answer phone calls. <laughs> it's a good feeling, I'm telling you. It's a good feeling to know there's nobody who can come knocking at your door and say, we've come to get the fridge, we've come to get the car, we've come. No, when you exercise the principles of the word of God, 
you step into a process of divine increase. The Bible says, and the Lord your God will increase you more and more, you and your children. There are so many promises. When of God says, the Lord your God will make you a thousand times more than what you are. That means God will, will multiply you. The word of God says, and Isaac sowed in the land in the time of famine. And the Lord blessed him, and he reaped in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord made him great, and he went forward and continued to become great until he was very great. The Bible says that the Lord made Abraham very rich in cattle, in silver, and gold. All these are promises that God has given to us about your financial position. How many scriptures, how many promises do you know today? Can you quote today that guarantee you your financial freedom? It's amazing. I, I'm, as a coach, one of the things that I do is I sit with people and I ask them questions like, what is your, we call it a desired reality. So I'd ask, what's your name? Elena. Erna. Oh, wow. Tons. Okay. Erna. Nice meeting you. So let's pretend like we're in a coaching session. And I'll ask questions like, well, what's your desired reality? What is it that you're desiring to see? Now, most adults will, uh, I'm asking an open-ended question about the desire. All the stuff that's up there, a beautiful house, money in the bank, debt free living, a beautiful car. But most adults don't tell me that. They'll tell me, you know, the economy is really difficult right now and you know Jacob Zuma is building another Nkandla so you know, things are really difficult. And I didn't I didn't ask you about Nkandla. I didn't ask you about the political situation. I didn't ask you about the economic situation. I just asked you what do you want? What's your desire? So because we have been mentally conditioned by the devil, we cannot see clearly what we desire. We did a kids finance conference a couple of weeks ago. So we had a whole bunch of kids in the room and we're teaching them about how to become millionaires. So I asked them, what do you want to become? None of them told me about Nkandla. None of them told me about the economy. None of them told me about that the, the, the exchange rate against the US dollar was really unfavorable. All of them told me, I want to be the, the wealthiest uh, cricket player. I want to be the best rugby player. I want to be the world champion in all the sports. I, I want to drive a really fast car. They told me all the great things they desire. But somehow from childhood to adulthood, somebody begins to contaminate our minds so that we think it is not possible to live the kind of lives that God has given to us. That's good. That's really good. That's really good. So I, I, I have to say this nicely. So I told the adults on the Sunday after the kids conference, I told them, guess what? Your children's biggest problem is you. <laughs> Without you guys, these kids would do great. Without the adults, the kids would run the country. They'll be the next president. They'll be the next billionaire. They'll be the next Bill Gates. They'll be. It's just that they have adults telling them money doesn't grow on trees. Come on, be reasonable. Stop dreaming so many things. Just, just want a humble life. Just be humble and, and sweet and just, just love Jesus. Why can't I love Jesus with a lot of money? Why can't I love Jesus with a fast car? Why can't I love Jesus in a 14 bedroom house with flat screens in all the rooms? <laughs> Let's see if we can. So the key, the key to your next level, there's, there's uh, a couple of beautiful words there. Knowledge, exposure, wisdom, information, experience, revelation, and the communities that you get yourself into. Let's talk about that a little bit. Let's, let's build our case. Let's read another scripture. The Bible says, Ecclesiastes 5.19. I told you I'll give you lots of scriptures. I love scriptures. Don't you love scriptures? I love the word of God. I love the word. It says, every man also to whom God giveth riches and wealth and hath given him the power to eat thereof and to him and to take his portion, pardon me, and to rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. What's the gift of God? To enjoy a good life. To live well, to live comfortably. That's the gift of God. God has given us the gift of enjoying a fruitful, 
successful life. He doesn't want you to be stressing about paying rent and paying bills and oh my goodness, fuel is going up by 35 cents next week. Let me fuel up today. So just before it goes up like that. Okay. Are you okay still? Can we go on? Are you learning something? <laughs> Chapter 2, verse 26. Let's read that. For God giveth to the man that is good in his sight. The man that is good in his sight. What does he give to him? Wisdom and? Ah, we've got it up there. So to the man that is good in his sight, he'll give him wisdom and knowledge and joy. Three powerful ingredients. Wisdom and knowledge and joy. So God gives to the person that is good in his sight, wisdom and knowledge and joy. Why does God give them these three powerful ingredients? Because wisdom is the principal thing. Every problem that you face in this world is a wisdom problem. All your marriage problems are wisdom problems. All your financial problems are wisdom problems. All your job and career problems and in-law problems are wisdom problems. There is a piece of wisdom that you need to acquire that will make your mother-in-law love you. My mom loves me. Oh my goodness, she loves me. She, she, she messages me sometimes more than she messages her daughter. And it's always nice, nice messages. How are you my son? How are you my pastor? I mean, she really loves me. Wisdom will make life beautiful. So he'll give you wisdom and then he'll give you knowledge. The Bible says it is through wisdom that a house is built. It is through understanding that it is established. And it is through knowledge that its chambers are filled with every good and precious thing. So when you get knowledge, your life begins to see increase. So every time I get a new piece of knowledge, for me, every new piece of knowledge that I get translates to money. So when I got knowledge about money, I wrote a book and I've sold many of these and I made money. <laughs> Amen. So the books are making money. So I have nine books that are circulating right now and all of them are making money for me. I have 16 businesses. We publish books. We do all kinds of stuff and every piece of knowledge makes money for me. I speak in different platforms, different places, different companies, and sometimes I get paid lots of money just for speaking for 30 minutes. Knowledge is powerful. There's a piece of knowledge that if you got today, your life will be totally different within 24 hours. Knowledge and then joy. <laughs> joy. Why does God give us joy? So we can enjoy life. God wants your every day to be filled with joy. God wants your every day to be filled with laughter, to be filled with enjoyment, fulfillment, satisfaction. Why? Because that's God's marketing department. Can you imagine if all of us here got out of here and we had a joyful day tomorrow and people look at you and say, what, what happened to you? Say, no, I was at a conference. The joy of the Lord. God is doing awesome things. I'm a millionaire. And they're thinking, I think I want to come. Where were you? Can I come with you? Is it open for everybody? Are other people allowed to come? But if you go through your day tomorrow looking like a sour lemon, no one will want to come here. You'll tell them, do you want to be a Christian? And say, and become like you? I'm having fun with my drugs. I'm having fun with my Johnny Walker. I don't want to be like you. But when you have joy, when you have joy, people just look at you and say, I want what you got. How about a double portion of joy in this week? How about a double portion of joy? How about a double portion? Joy every day of your life. Walking around and saying, I'm joyful. I'm a millionaire. Money is coming to me. The Lord has blessed me exceedingly. That's, but notice the next part of the verse. After it talks about the good man, the righteous man. But to the sinner, he giveth travail to gather and to heap. Why? That he may give it to him that is good before God. What has he just done? He's just given the job description of the sinner and the job description of the saint. So the sinner works hard. He toils. He's 
words. Why? To gather. Why? So that it can be transferred to me. Why? Because Proverbs chapter 10 verse 22 says, The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich. And he adds no sorrow, no toil with it. In other words, as believers, our victory ought to be sweatless. No toil. You ought to enjoy the good life filled with joy without toil. And that's exactly what has happened to us. I tell people, you guys are black. Black movies don't make much money. If you're, if you're Afrikaans, Afrikaans movies make lots of money, like Leon Schuster, and they, live, they, they mention the number of people, but you guys are black. And second, it's a Christian movie. Christian movies don't make money. So I, so I came out of there and I was thinking, Lord, I'm excited about doing our movies. And, and then God says, start your own bank and finance your own movies. And I thought, oh wow, that's awesome. So I start a finance house and I finance my own movies and I pay myself for financing my movies. Then I make money from the movies. <laughs> Wisdom and prudence will work together to bring witty inventions. Lay hands on your head and say, I am creative. Come and say it again. Say, I am creative. I have the wisdom of God and the anointing of God to bring forth witty inventions. From today, ideas are flowing from me that will change my life forever. Amen. 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 That's powerful. That's powerful. What would happen if that was your language every day? You speak to yourself and say, I have ideas in me that will change my life. I have ideas that will create money. I have ideas that will translate to wealth. I did that for six months. And from that day, I had to stop because I couldn't handle all the ideas that were now coming. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God forever. Why are you learning something? Let's read another scripture, then I'm going to give you a whole bunch of principles. This is from 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 5 to 7. It says, And after, after that you shall come to Gibeah Elohim, or the hill of God, in the English Bible. Gibeah Elohim, the hill of God. Where there is a garrison of the Philistines, and there... As soon as you come to the city, you will meet a group of prophets, thank you Lord Jesus, coming down from the hill to the, uh, and the high place with a harp and a tambourine and a flute and a lyre before them prophesy and the spirit of the Lord will rush upon you and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Now when these signs meet you, do what your hand finds to do, for God is Ebrosi Kalara Shakata, is with you. I want to tell somebody tonight, the Spirit of God is going to come upon you. I carry on me a wealth anointing. I carry on me a wealth anointing that is able to translate people's lives, transform, transform people's lives from one stage to another. I've seen that in our church, I've seen that in our own lives, I've seen that in many places that we have gone to. And I believe that God wants to do exactly the same. There's a flow here tonight, there's a receiving of the word, there's a hunger for the word, there's a hunger for the anointing. That I believe is going to cause a rushing of the anointing upon people's lives. And as the Spirit of God rushes upon you, the Bible says, like it was with, 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 with the king, with King Saul, he says you shall be turned into another man. You came in here today and your mind was thinking poverty, your mind was thinking lack, your mind was thinking debt, but tonight... God is going to transform your life and you'll come out of here thinking, I will be wealthy. I'm going to become the wealthiest cattle rancher in the region. I am about to get into platinum. I'm about to get into diamonds. I'm about to get into... And God, I mean, one of our sons, he's, he's now doing platinum. He just started a couple of months ago this year. But he's doing platinum in a place where... Firstly, because of his color, his background and everything, he had everything working against him. But because he carries an anointing, he's making inroads into the area of platinum. Another one of our sons, he's doing business in, in um, 
Emma Lafeni is beginning to get into call and he's now creating a team of about three of them and they're all working to be moving, I think it's about five, five to ten million tons of coal to Burundi. Now, you can imagine the size of the contract. Now, these were people that a year ago were just ordinary people, but when the anointing came upon them, the doors began to open for them to step into another level. And I can guarantee you, it's up to you. It's up to what you speak. You shall have what you say. If you shift your language tonight, if you allow the Spirit of God to come upon you, the Bible says, and Saul began to prophesy, and the said, is so also among the prophets. When the Spirit of God comes upon you, the first thing he wants to do is change your language. When he changes your language, he can change your position. God's greatest challenge with working with you is what you're speaking. What your mouth is saying. In order to possess the wealth of the wicked and to step into significant wealth, you're going to have to understand that you have to change your language. There's a principle I want to throw at you. The covenant you make with God is the foundation of the wealth that you will take. The covenant. Have you made a covenant with the house of God? Let me let me talk a little bit of, of what I call spiritual business econ economics right here. How does this financial system work? There are, there's a, there are two parallel financial systems. One is what I call the, the Babylonian financial system and the other one is what I call the kingdom of God financial system. The Babylonian financial system is based on Babylon. That's why God brought Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees for Babylon and he established him in Canaan. And in calling him to Canaan, he was saying, come out of Babylon. Why? Because Babylon had a financial system. Our current financial systems globally are based on the principles that were established in Babylon. And the Babylonian system is based on greed, it's based on self-centeredness, it's based on self-preservation, and it's built on fear. Did you get that? It's built on fear, it's built on self-centeredness, self-preservation, and it's built on greed. So God says, come out of greed, come out of self-centeredness, come out of selfishness, come out of fear, and let me establish through you, Abraham, a new generation that will operate on faith, that will operate on generosity, and that will operate on establishing the kingdom of God. So the secular system, the financial system of the secular system centers around the bank. So the bank is the hub of what Satan does. So Satan uses the bank to be the place of hoarding and keeping his gold. Now God's equivalent of the bank is the church. So Jesus says, hey, you can keep your treasure in a place where moth and canker will get and thieves will break in and steal. That's the banking system. Or you could keep your money in a place that is spiritual and eternal where thieves cannot break in and thieves cannot steal. What is that system? It's God's financial system which is based in the house of God. So how do I become... Now, here's the principle. When you're finishing college, you advise that you must go and open an account, buy a TV and make sure you pay it up. Now here's the principle. When you go to um, Incredible Connection and you open an account and buy a television set, immediately they ask for your ID, they ask for your proof of address, they get all your details. Why? Because they need to capture you in a computer system which is connected to the Babylonian system which now makes you what is called a financial citizen. So the moment you have an account, you become a financial citizen. And they rate the financial citizens in the Babylonian system based on your faithfulness to pay what you owe Babylon. That is why if you get a fridge and you pay it faithfully, you get what? A good credit rating. Because you're faithful to pay up. And if you pay up your fridge, in the last two months of you paying up your fridge, they send you a letter saying you've been such a good financial citizen and you paid back your 14000 Now we can give you uh, points worth 50000 
then you pay that up. So based on your points in the financial system, you can now buy a car on finance. You can now buy a house on finance. You okay with that? You understand that already? You already know that stuff. But here's how it works on the other side. On the other side, we don't operate on just the faithfulness to pay our monthly obligations. It is our faithfulness to honor our tithes and offerings. Okay? I knew it would get, I knew it would get a bit quiet. But I'm used to it getting quiet, so I, I'm okay with it. I'm not nervous. I'm not nervous. I understand that you're thinking right now. <laughs> so your faithfulness. It's amazing, Pastor, how that people are more faithful to pay Joshua Dor than they are to honor the tithes of the house. We're more faithful to our account than we are to our offering. So most of us, here, here, here's how I tell, most of us, our tithing and our offering on our budget is generally on our expenses, not on our income. Because we don't have the revelation that a tithe is not an expense, it is an income. Tithes and offerings should be on the top part, the income part of our budget, not the expense part. So that's why people say, I paid my tithes. No, you don't pay your tithes, you give your tithes. So God, God, God teaches us a powerful lesson, and I teach this in, in the book uh, about Abraham. How that Abraham came from the battle of the kings. And the Bible says, on his way back from the battle of the kings, he meets two people. The first person that he meets is a man called Berah, who is king of Sodom. Sodom was a product of Babylon. And then the next king that he meets is a man called Melech Tzedek, Melchizedek. Melech Tzedek translated, Melech in Hebrew is king. Tzedek is righteousness. That's where we get Jehovah Sidkin, which means God, our righteousness. So righteousness, that word means right standing with. Now if you pay your SARS obligations on a monthly basis and on an annual basis, they give you a letter which is called a letter of good standing. That's a letter of righteousness. So SARS confers righteousness on me because I paid my yearly or annual returns. <laughs> so in the same way that SARS gives me a letter of right standing, when I honor my tithes and my offerings in the kingdom of God, I also get a letter of good standing. It's called righteousness. So Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, meets with Abraham. And Berah says, just give me the people, take the money. And he says, I cannot take the money, lest you say I made Abraham rich. Because there are people that look rich. Because Sodom has made you look rich. So we have a fake form of wealth that is being demonstrated in the world. We see people, I gotta be nice on this, I gotta really be nice, I gotta be nice. I wanna come back, Bethlehem is an awesome place. I've always dreamt of going to the place where Jesus was born. But <laughs> so there are people, let me talk to Pastor, he's got an awesome smile. Let me, let me not look at everybody else. So there are people that look okay, but the car is not theirs. They look good in church, but the clothes are not theirs. They ate food that they are still going to be paying for for the next six months. Living in a house that is not theirs. But God is saying, I want you to be real. I want you to be real. I want you to come out of debt. I want you to activate my kingdom principles. I want you to become righteous. Stand before me righteous. Understand how I operate and begin to exercise the principles of the kingdom of God. And I will move you to a place where you are really wealthy. 
You don't have to look wealthy. You don't have to pretend you're wealthy. You are really wealthy. You are truly blessed. You're not in debt. You're not getting high blood pressure and hypertension because you're thinking of all the bills and all the things that you're supposed to pay. I better be nice tonight. Okay, I'm starting to close. I'm starting to close. I'm, I better come back. Lord, help me, Jesus. So, Abraham meets Bera. Bera says, give me the, 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 the people, keep the goods. He says, no, I'm not going to take anything. I'm not going to shoot that shit from you. I'm going to give you everything that belongs to you, except that which the man that I'm with have eaten. I, that's all we're going to say. They say we'll take it. And then Melchizedek comes. Melchizedek was the king of righteousness, but he was also, the Bible says, the high priest of the Lord. Priest of the most high God. And then the Bible says he came with bread and wine. Bread and wine was speaking of covenant. Bread and wine. Remember, I gave you the principle. The covenant that you make is the foundation for the wealth that you will take. So he, he, he comes with bread and wine. Bread and wine speaks of the death, the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ. His resurrection is sitting at the right hand of the Father. The bread and wine was speaking of, here is a person in the Old Testament jumping over to the New Testament to partake of New Testament blessings while he was in the Old Testament. Here is a man who gives access to a revelation about the, the power of covenant even before Christ manifests he is able to activate something that is in the future by virtue of revelation. So the Bible says when he sees Melchizedek carrying the bread and the wine, he comes to him and he gives him 10%. Now 10% here, you may think was just get my wallet out and give Melchizedek 10%. But I believe that that tithing that he did that day probably took half the day or the whole day, maybe even two days. Because when he went and fought those kings, those five kings had raided three kings and they had raided four kings. So he, they were carrying with them the wealth of 14 kings. So when Abraham overcame the world, those guys that were, they probably had 200,000 cattle and 200,000 sheep and 500 camels and bags of wheat and I don't know how many chickens. And now he comes, you can imagine Abraham coming with this great multitude of wealth. Now he had to tithe, give 10% to Melchizedek. Now, when the spiritual covenant was established, this is what happened. Melchizedek, the priest, blessed him. And here's the blessing. He says, blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Now, when we read our English Bibles, they tell us God blessed him. And the blessing was, you are blessed by the Most High God. But in the Hebrew, this is what it says. Abraham, I am making you the owner and the possessor of the title deeds of heaven and earth. Blessed be Abraham, possessor of heaven and earth. And that blessing made on that day, made Abraham the wealthiest man of his time. And it had nothing to do with his geographic location. It had nothing to do with his family name. It has nothing to do with his race or his color. It had everything to do with the covenant that he made. And I believe tonight there are people that God wants to transition to their next level. I'm closing now. Now here's how the financial, we said the financial system of the world centers around the bank. The financial system of the kingdom of God centers around the house of God. Now here's how it works. With every year that comes in, every season of this ministry, God will give the pastor a vision. Now the size, listen carefully, the size of the vision that God gives to him will determine the size of the wealth that he's about to release into your life. Let me say it again. Let me say it again. Let me say it again. The size 
of financial increase that God is going to bring to the people in this house. Almost a concomitant. It's, uh, it's in proportion. There we go. Is in proportion to the vision that God gives to him. Now if God gives him or if he comes up and he declares that our vision for this year is going to require 10,000 rand. Guess what God is going to do for the members of the church? He's going to give you a hundred thousand rand collectively. But if he comes up and he begins to say, we need 500 million rand for the next phase of this ministry. You can sit there and say, pastor wants our money. We know these pastors, they just want our money. No, God gives him a vision, not because he needs money. God gives him a vision because he needs something that he can use to release money into your life. So if he starts talking about 500 million as the budget for the next phase of the church, then we've got to take 500 million and multiply it by 10. That makes it what? 5 billion. That means God is about to release 5 billion billion rand in the hands of the people collectively now here's how it operates the moment a fiscal year a financial year is announced by the prophet of the house or the father of the house heaven is obligated to move that money from wherever it was into a trust account that has the ministry name on it economics here. This is how it operates. This is how it works. So he speaks of the 500 million. God says, angels, let's move 5 billion into the trust account. He cannot release it into your hands until you demonstrate the level of trust that you can have. No, you may be saying, okay, pastor, please, please, please you've got to prove that. For have you read the book of Philippians? The book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 1 verse 7, Paul writes and he says, Hey, you Philippians, no other church communicated concerning giving and receiving except you. And we see that in the book of Acts chapter 16. That's where the Philippian church was birthed. When Paul went to Caesarea Philippi and he preached the gospel, when he saw the vision of the man saying, come over to Macedonia, he went to Macedonia and the first city they came to was Philippi. And they preached the gospel and they used the house of a woman who was called Lydia, the seller of purple, a very wealthy woman, very influential woman to be a seller of purple. You are connected to the who's who's, the politicians, the business people of the city because ordinary people did not use purple. It was a fabric that was ex exclusive to the wealthiest people. So this woman was well connected. She constrains Paul and says, Paul, come and stay in our house. And God begins a work in her heart that causes her to be a conduit of financial blessing for Paul's ministry. So when he writes in the letter to the Philippians, he says, no other church communicated with me concerning giving and receiving except you only. And because of that, you have become partakers of my grace. That's verse 7 of chapter 1 of Philippians. You become partakers of the anointing that is upon my life. And it is the anointing that removes the yoke. It is the anointing that removes the burden. So because you have become partakers, chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, he begins to tell them specifically to say, Hey, because of what you have done, my God shall supply all you need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Riches in glory. Riches in in glory riches in glory so there is riches that are stored up in a place called glory that we access by the by the power of our tithes and our offerings in the same letter that Paul writes to the Philippians he says hey I am not doing this because I desire the money but I desire the treasure that will be transferred to your account Oh, so you mean, Paul, every time I give in the house of God, it activates something in the spirit? Yes. Just like the same way, your old mutual fund, you're putting money in there every month. What's happening? You're gaining interest on it. You're gaining profit on it. It's an investment. So in the kingdom of God, based on how you have been faithful to give of your tithes and your offerings, 
The money that is in the trust account has got your name on it. <laughs> Glory to God. All the people that are tithing and saying yes. And all those that haven't been tithing and say, oh my goodness. <laughs> now it's not too late. It's not too late. I gotta stop. I gotta stop. I sense there's an anointing in the house. I sense the anointing is in the house. I sense God wants to do a really special work in your life today. I sense that the Lord has set up a work to be done by this house, by this ministry. Pastor Ron, Pastor, God has placed his hand upon you and upon the ministry. I believe God wants to take you on one of the most amazing journeys where he says, like he said to Abraham, I will make your name great. Where he says, like he said to Abraham, through you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That, again, is another verse that's mistranslated in our English Bibles. The Hebrew Bible says, through you shall all the families of the earth bless themselves. In other words, everything that begins to connect to you will bless itself. By virtue of being in relationship, by virtue of connecting with you in prayer, connecting with you in covenant, connecting with you in tithes and offerings, I begin to bless myself. How do people on the earth bless themselves and take their lives to another level? By connecting with a genuine anointing. Just the same way, if you want to access the wealth of the wicked or financial resources, you connect with F&B, with APSA, with Standard Bank. That causes you to access whatever they have in trust. So the same way, every man of God is a steward of kingdom resources. And God says, I have made you a steward of great resources. I have made you a steward of some of the most powerful business people in the, in the province. Some of the most influential business people whose voice shall be heard far and wide. God says, I'm entrusting you with wealth, with resources. I'm entrusting you with ideas. I'm entrusting you with creative concepts that through you, people shall step into their next level of business. Through you and what I'm doing in the house, I shall cause many to step into a new season in their lives. Financial seasons shall be activated because of the anointing that is upon your life. Financial seasons in the marketplace in business shall be activated by virtue of the words that you will speak. You will make decrees and those words shall be established. And those that shall hear those words, like it is said of the prophet Samuel, that none of the words that came out of his mouth fell to the ground. So shall it be that the words that flow forth out of your mouth, they shall carry weight, they shall carry influence. Through the words that you shall decree and declare, it shall come to pass that policy, procedure, and processes shall be changed and shall be shifted in favor of those that are under your apostolic authority. And it shall come to pass that the heavens shall be opened over them. We Wisdom shall be given as an anointing. Wisdom shall be released as a grace even upon this house. It shall be that as people walk in, they shall say, when I walked in and I sat and I listened to the word taught and to the wisdom shared and to the counsel that shall flow forth in the house, it is as if my mind was opened and lights began to come on and I saw what I'd never seen before and I heard what I've never heard before and I began to possess what I never knew existed. I see in the days to come a move of God and a move of the Spirit of God that shall break forth not just out of this house but out of the house of God, out of every place where true worship and the word is taught. I see a move of God beginning to resonate and to vibrate in the city and beginning to shake the city and many in influence, many in political and business influence shall come to the house of the Lord and say we have come to be taught, we have come to be guided, we have come to be given wisdom and counsel. We have come to inquire of the Lord and as they sit to hear their lives shall be Oh, they call the fair and 
Rakita, Alekere de Feriata. Lives shall be healed. Lives shall be delivered. Lives shall be set free because of the word that shall break forth out of this house. And out of this house shall flow forth a river like the river of Ezekiel. And it shall flow forth as the word says, and out of the east gate. And it shall flow forth towards the east all the way to Engedi and all the way down to Enaglia. And he says, I looked at their man measured a thousand cubits. And when I went through the waters, it was waters up to my ankles. And he measured again another thousand. And the waters went to my knees. And he measured again and it was to my waist. And he measured again and it was a river so deep that it had to be swum through. And he says, and then I looked and I saw the trees were always there, but he didn't see them before. But when you swim in the river, you begin to see what you never saw before. You begin to have revelation of the mind, the will, the purpose, and the plans of God to see opportunities that have always been before you, but you did not see them. Opportunities and business and breakthroughs and doors that are open that you always thought were closed. And it shall come to pass that men and women will swim in the river that is flowing in this house and they shall come out and begin to see and say, ah, 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 ekeno, brekele, kero de hete, vreena, and say yes yes I see it yes I see that which you're doing Lord yes I see that which you're prepared for me yes I see that which you've put in place and I see it and I stretch forth my hand of faith and I possess that which is mine and it shall come to pass as the river begins to flow even further down he says I looked and I saw and there were many ships that were catching fish, both small and great. There's a harvest coming, both of small and great. Wealthy people, poor people, known people, unknown people, influential people, non-influential people. But when they come into the house, <laughs> it shall be as if they've stepped into a zone of transformation, into a place of glory, and they shall become what they were not before. And they shall step into a new place in the spirit, a new place in the glory, a new place in the anointing. And one will look and say, is this the same man that I knew before? Is this the same woman? And you shall say, no, no, no. I have become another woman. I have become another man. I'm not who I was. The Lord has placed his anointing upon me and I have been changed. For it shall be called a place of change. It shall be called a place of healing. It shall be called a place of restoration those that are broken and wounded and hurting and falling apart will come into my house and find the anointing and be restored and be healed and be built up again and be made whole and they shall say the house of the Lord is the house of healing the house of the Lord is the house of restoration the house of the Lord is the house of transformation it is a place where our lives are made whole. And what is that sound that I hear in the realm of the spirit? Is it not the sound of the rain falling upon the people? Is it not the sound of the rain of heaven falling upon the people of God? What is the rain for? One may ask. Is it not the rain to prepare the hearts of the people for the move of God that is coming? Is it not the preparation of the hearts of the people to receive the move of God that is coming? What is the sound that I hear? It's the sound of the abundance of rain coming upon the people to move them to a place of abundance, a place of prosperity, a place of breaking forth into the fullness of that which the Lord has prepared. Oh, there's a glory in the house. There's a glory in the house. There's a glory in the house. Have some peanuts. There's a glory in the house. God is at work right now. The glory of God is in the house. Right now God is touching people. The people in this place, God has been speaking to you really strongly as I spoke and as I taught today. 
and you're beginning to see in your heart that yes, it is possible. There are dreams that you had, there are visions that you had, there are things that the Lord has shown you, instructions that the Lord had given, but somewhere along the line, oh, somewhere along the line, the words of man and the counsel of man had frustrated the vision of God and the purpose of God and they told you, you cannot go there, you cannot become that, you cannot do that, and you have shut yourself down and you say, this is all there is to my life. But hear the word of the Lord today. I came as a prophet today to declare to you there is more. There is more that is prepared. There is more that God will bring forth out of you. There is more that God has prepared and put on the inside of you. And today, it's been crying out and saying, I want to break forth. I want to come out. I want to take you to the place that are prepared for you. I want to take you to the place of wealth, the place of abundance, the place of influence. Yes, you've been through difficult times and the psalmist declares and he says, I've been through the fire, I've been through the water. Oh, you have caused men to ride over over my head but now I have come to my wealthy place the Hebrew Bible says the wealthy place is the place where seed will blossom and sprout and produce a harvest even before it hits the ground God is about to bring increase in your life God is about to bring such favor in your life God is about to bring such increase and an overflow in your life God is changing the season in your life financial seasons material prosperity God has brought that. I have come all the way to Bethlehem in this in this wonderful free state to declare to you the word of the Lord. Your time has come. Your time has come. Your time has come. Your time has come. That which the Lord has prepared, the time is now. That which the Lord has put in place, the time is now. That vision that you put in your heart and almost let it die, God says the vision is for an appointed time. Though it tarry, it will not tarry. It shall surely speak and not lie. The time for the vision has come. The time for you to rise up and say, I am wealthy. I am anointed to take the marketplace. I am anointed to go into the marketplace and make wealth for the kingdom of God. That time is now, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. I came to encourage somebody right now. I know I'm closing. I know this is the end. But I came to encourage somebody. It's time to get up. You've been sitting down for so long. It's time to get up. It's time to plan. It's time to see. See, I have given into your hand. Jericho, I've given into your hand the king and the mighty men thereof. God has given you business at a level that you've never thought possible. God has given you opportunity and now is the time. It's time to get up. Amos chapter 9 the word of God says the time is coming and now is. What time is coming? When the sower shall overtake the reaper. There's an acceleration. There's an acceleration. There's an acceleration. There's an acceleration. Things are going to pick it up. Things are going to pick up. God in six years gave us 16 businesses. God in six years has accelerated our lives and done something supernatural. I know it is possible. I know God can do it. I know God can open doors that no man can shut. So I came to declare to you, the time is coming. And now it is. For you to step into that which the Lord has prepared for you. The message Bible says, everywhere you look, blessing, blessing, blessing. Things will happen so fast, your head will swim. <laughs> the time for you to be glad, the time for you to rejoice has come, says the Lord. Lift up your hands. If you can, please stand on your feet. Forgive me, stand on your feet. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. Bless your name. Oh, there's such an anointing. There's such an anointing in the house. There's such an anointing. Lift up those hands to him. Father, pour upon us a fresh anointing. Live and rush. If you pray, the Holy Ghost, just go ahead. So if you begin to pray, the Holy Spirit right now. 
There's a fresh anointing coming upon your life. There's a fresh anointing. Father, I rebuke the spirit of death. I rebuke the spirit of false teachings. I rebuke the spirit of fear. I rebuke the spirit of confinement. I rebuke the spirit of stagnation. I rebuke the spirit of limitation in the name of Jesus. Some of you have been so crippled by debt, you don't think it is possible to live a debt-free life. I came as a prophet of God to take you to your next level. It is possible. It is possible. It is possible. God says, I'm going to give you ideas. I'm going to give you witty inventions. I'm going to give you creative concepts. Young people in this house, be faithful, be planted, be consistent, be diligent, be passionate, be teachable. Receive teaching from your pastors. Receive guidance from your pastors. God is going to do such a glorious work through your life. God is going to take you on a journey that will enlarge you. No limits, no weights from the past, no limits from old teachings and old doctrines and old religious beliefs, but you will begin to step into your place of financial authority. God is saying to me right now, I'm about to raise out of this church people that will begin to take marketplace territory, marketplace territory, marketplace territory. He says, I'm about to make your name a brand. I'm about to make your business a brand. I'm about to give you a new level of influence that you've never seen before. I'm about to give you clients that with one signing, one contract, one opportunity, you're going to cover your expenses for the whole year. God is saying, I'm about to open doors that will cause you to have such financial favor in the marketplace. I'm releasing this word into your life. You better receive the prophetic word. The Bible says, he brought them out by a prophet and by a prophet they were preserved. It is a prophetic word that will take you to the next level. The, the prophetic word will birth strategy. It will birth ideas. It will birth wisdom and knowledge. I release that anointing in this house right now. In the name of Jesus. You better receive it right now. In the name. In the name of Jesus. I bless you with favor. I bless you with wisdom. I bless you with knowledge. I bless you with understanding. I bless you with opportunity. I bless you with breakthrough. I bless you with favor. I bless you with access. I bless you with elevation, promotion, and establishment. According to the word of the Lord. I was young and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or the seed begging for bread. God says, I'm moving out of the place of begging. I'm moving out of the place of limitation. I'm moving out of the place of frustration. I'm moving out of the place of confinement and into your wealthy place, into your large and open territory. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, I see that couple. My goodness. I see a couple, I see a, a family here, heavily burdened by debt. Heavily burdened by debt. Heavily burdened by debt. I, I declare upon you in the name, it's affecting your marriage, it's affecting your family. Right now in the name of Jesus, I address that foul spirit of debt. I address that spirit of fear. I address that pressure that is on your marriage. And I declare in the name of Jesus, loose that family. Loose! That family, you in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. And I declare you will not cause divorce in the name of Jesus. You will not break that marriage in the name of Jesus. I come against you right now in the name of Jesus. And I declare that marriage is blessed in the name of Jesus. Health is restored. Strength is restored. Love is restored. Unity is restored. Freshness comes upon that marriage right now in the name that is above every name. I declare right now restoration, restoration, restoration. Can I quickly just pray and lay hands? I want to pray and lay hands on people that are saying, Pastor, I need new ideas to be released in my life and in my spirit. Can I quickly just lay hands? I believe in impartation. I believe in impartation and I believe impartations take place through laying hands, through the laying on of hands. So if you're here and you're saying, Pastor, pray for me, just lay hands on me. I want an activation of ideas. I carry that and I want you to just come down here to the front and I'm going to pray for you quickly. Ideas. Oh yes, thank you. The music helps. Thank you, Jesus. Just quickly lift up your hands. Father, thank you for a fresh anointing. I release in this house business 
creative concepts, ideas that will make existing businesses grow to the next level and the birth of new businesses, new ideas. Father, I release upon this house, Father, a new level of creativity, a new level of wisdom and revelation that will cause these men and women of God, this church, to carry such a presence, to carry such an authority, to carry such a boldness in the name of Jesus. I declare that mercy and grace is stepping into a new level of influence, not just in Bethlehem, not just in the free state, but in South Africa, in the name of Jesus, that it is a brand that shall influence the nations. Out of this house shall break forth ideas and knowledge that shall cause Libra Kushande Yalabaka Satai, Rota Yabashakata Yalabaka Ramanda Yalabaka Shakatai, a new birth of ideas in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I release a new level of creativity. In the name of Jesus, a new level of wisdom. In the name of Jesus, wisdom and creativity. I release in the name of Jesus. In the name that is above every name. Wisdom and revelation is an anointing. It is an anointing. It is an anointing. Oh, I need help. I need help. Move with me if you can. Thank you. I release, I release wisdom and revelation. Wisdom and revelation. Wisdom and revelation. Just begin to pray gently in the Holy Spirit, everybody. The anointing is flowing in the house. Wisdom and revelation. Creative ideas. Concepts are given. New heart like you did with soul. That he was changed into another man. Into another man. New level of wisdom and revelation. In the name of Jesus. Wisdom and revelation. In the name of Jesus. Wisdom and revelation. I release upon you. In the name of Jesus. Wisdom and revelation. Upon your life in the name of Jesus. Oh Ramanda Labara Kashata Yalabaka Sataya. Rota Yalaba Shakata Yalabaka Ramanda Yalabaka. New level of wisdom and revelation. Wisdom and revelation. Ideas. Enlarged by the anointing in the name of Jesus. Wisdom and revelation. Wisdom and revelation. Wisdom. Shata yalabaka. Sela praki shekata. Kormanda yalabaka. Kormande lelebo korbash te kiriata yalabaka. Wisdom and revelation. Wisdom and revelation. New ideas given. New ideas. Knowledge. I am in a sekorbai. Rota yalabako shande lebe korbai. Wisdom, wisdom and authority in the marketplace. I release upon you a new level of authority, a new level of faith, a new spirit of faith. The Lord says I release a new spirit of faith and it will bring authority. You will declare and decree things and they'll begin to fall in place. You will silence the voice of the enemy through your words and through the authority I place upon you. New authority. I release it upon this house in the name of Jesus. I release it upon this house. I release upon this house in the name of Jesus. New level of creativity. A fresh anointing upon your life, the ability to hear the voice of Lembre Manglo Shakri Dalabaraki Satai. There's a strong flow of the glory of God, a strong flow of the glory, a strong flow of the glory. Whoever I laid hands on, a new flow of the glory of God. If I've laid hands on you, you may go back to your seat. Father, thank you. A freshness of your heart. Oh, new wisdom. God says I'm giving you a new level of wisdom, creativity. A new level of wisdom. The ability to tap into the mind and the will and the purpose of God. Through you shall flow. Great, great, great. Wisdom. We're in his attack. Rachel Afraid of Everybody is still praying in the Holy Ghost. There's a flow of the glory. 
And when we're in the glory, you pray in the spirit, you worship God, you look to Jesus, you look to Jesus. He's the releaser of the glory. You look to the one who Febra Kala Dora Kela Brakita Kera Barakela Maranesh Feredes Tokaralehe Stakera Nangele Secora Delama Mangele Hush Kera La Brakisha Efela Kera Nosh Kera Le Berenice Kera Lehe Tombra Wool Le Bracorumela Kera Bengala Stakera Bai Paralehe Stokore Firinosh the Kera Day La Veradosh a new level of boldness, boldness, no fear, no fear, no fear, no fear, boldness in the in the marketplace, a new boldness, creativity. There's such a powerful anointing upon you, woman of God, such a powerful anointing upon you. Lembron Shikarama and Yalishna Puriata, Ritola Barakela Barakish Dikalama. Shte kere yahani le fred dola mara mingen shto heheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheh
Wow, thank you so much. It's just an honor and a privilege to have you. Thank you so much for getting back very, very soon.